I am Theo Rossi. I play Juice, or as Xander behind the camera likes to say, the Juice. It's extraordinarily rare when a show or movie comes along and changes you. I mean, sure, sometimes they pop up and you can have a good time with them, but it's exceptional when you can walk away from watching something and feel different. Like there's a void in your life that wasn't there before and you're not exactly sure what to fill it with. For me, that show was Sons of Anarchy. And it wasn't until I finished my second viewing of Sons that I realized that the void in me just so happened to be motorcycle shaped. So I did what any responsible 24 year old going through a quarter life crisis would do. I put a down payment on a motorcycle I was not financially ready to deal with. Not this one. This is my baby, but she wasn't my first. I actually popped my Moto Cherry on this beautiful jet black 2017 Suzuki Boulevard 650 that I can barely find any pictures or videos of, but she was the perfect beginner bike for me. I would have gotten a Harley, but I guess the weeb in me really wanted something Japanese. I eventually ended up totaling her barely a year later because I'm a moron who tried to cure a slide and crashed, but then here comes that void again. Being unable to ride between that bike and this one, I figured why not spin the block on Sons of Anarchy again. And it was during this third watch that I came to the conclusion that not only was this my favorite show of all time, but the protagonist, Jax Teller, was a front runner for my favorite fictional character of all time. Walter White eventually won out, but my boy Jax was a close second. I'll make a video on Jax one day, but there's another character that I found somehow more intriguing. That character is Juan Carlos Ortiz, aka... Hold that thought. Healthy, I wouldn't be surprised is Pierre Strong who has Man <sighs> It's more like it <clears throat> AKA Juice Created by Kurt Sutter, Sons of Anarchy was one of the more critically acclaimed, highly rated shows on FX during its seven season run, and if you're watching this video, I'm gonna assume that you're at least somewhat familiar with the plot, but in case you're not, go watch Sons of Anarchy right now, this is a god tier television show, holy shit! Right, like I was saying, in case you're unfamiliar with the plot, I'll give you the spark notes first. Sons of Anarchy follows the founding charter of a motorcycle club of the same name based out of the fictional town of Charming, California and their various escapades and run-ins with the law, rival clubs, and various criminals affectionately and sometimes not so affectionately referred to as Sam Crow. So Sam Crow is an acronym for Sons of Anarchy Motorcycle Club Redwood Original and it took me about three seasons to figure that out so I'm putting it on the screen so we all know we're all on the same page now. Sporting his trademark mohawk flanked by two parallel tribal tats, Juice is one of the newer members of Sam Crow. In the early seasons, he's the club's tech support, street pharmacist, and source of comic relief. More often than not, he seems to be the butt of the joke. Look at him, he's foaming at the mouth. That thing should be dead. I dosed him like two grams. Crims of what? Crank! The other members clearly care about him, as seen when he gets shanked in prison, but are simultaneously annoyed by him, like an irritating little brother, Clay especially, as seen when Juice gets his cut stolen by a rival MC. He's probably the least hardened member out of everybody in the club, but he wants to be perceived as this scary tough guy, and that just isn't who he is. Juice is in a world that, if you really think about it, he should never have been in at all. You know, he, he should have been a comic book kid. He shouldn't have been in a motorcycle club because he's not cut out for it. In seasons one through three, 
Juice acts more as an extra body to fill out the club as opposed to a fully realized character. Jax and Clay are obviously where the primary focus of the show lies, but even Opie, Tig, Bobby, Chibs, and Piney get mini character arcs as where Juice is kinda just there, feeling more like a prospect and less like a patched member. That all changes in season 4 where Theo Rossi, Juice's actor, gets a lot more screen time. This new season essentially serves as not just a soft reboot for the show, but also that of Juice as a character. After some of the sons, including Juice, get out of prison, he's targeted by Charming's new sheriff, Roosevelt, who's recently joined forces with assistant U.S. attorney Potter. Because they find out that Juice's father was black, they plan on using him to spy on Sam Crow's activities by exploiting an outdated bylaw within the club about not allowing black members. There's no brothers on your wall. What's up with that? What's up is not having any brothers on the wall. Fearing that he'd have his patch stripped if they ever found out, Juice reluctantly agrees with the condition that they only go after the Galindo cartel and not the Sons. And this is something I've seen people online call a plot hole or a plot contrivance because at worst, if they found out about his black lineage, they would just kick him out. But if they found out he was a rat, they take him out back and give him the old yellow treatment, aka mayhem. So why would he even do it? And I gotta call Cap on that because Juice might be technologically proficient, but he ain't exactly the sharpest tool in the shed. It's a very in-character thing for him to think this way, so I think Sons of Anarchy beats the plot hole allegations for now. In the appropriately titled episode, Brick, at the behest of Potter, Roosevelt requests a sample of the coke that the club is trafficking for the cartel to help build their case, and Juice tries to steal it but gets interrupted in the attempt and panics by stuffing the entire key down his pants, hiding out in the woods, waiting for a chance to put it back when no one is watching. He ends up falling asleep overnight and misses his opportunity, having to stash the key in some bushes. And of course, when it comes up missing, fingers start getting pointed and the club instantly believe him when he says he didn't do it because... He's a brother. Why would he be the culprit? The blame lands on the prospects in the Mayans, the only other people who were there. And with the cartel on the way to inspect their inventory, there isn't time to act nicely so the methods of interrogation get more and more brutal. This clearly bothers Juice as his guilty conscience starts to give way, instructing everyone in the building to take a walk so he can slip the key back inside. When he goes to get it, another member of Sam Crow named Miles catches him in the act and pieces together what happened. Juice once again panics and tackles him, getting shot in the process. They begin to fight and in a moment of desperation, Juice picks up the gun and kills Miles. I came out to take a piss. I spotted him pulling something out of the leash. He saw me and he freaked out. He tried to kill me. He frames Miles for the missing key and the other members view him as a traitor when in reality, the only guilty party is Juice himself. The guilt compounded with his betrayal of the club, the only family he has, causes him to develop intense feelings of anxiety and depression. So much so that Chips picks up on it and informs Clay. Initially dismissive of Juice, Clay awards him a Men of Mayhem patch not only to let him know how proud he is, but also to encourage Juice to snap out of it and move on, but he can't do that. He tried to steal from the club, killed a brother as a result, and is now being rewarded for it. It's all too much for Juice to handle, and he decides to unalive himself, but the branch he was using to support himself on the tree breaks. You're not dead. What happened with the branch? Juice is so uh, out of his mind at this point. Even doing something like this, he manages to mess it up. You know, it's just him. It's always been him. He figures out a way to even screw this up. Self unalivization is a colossal red flag within Sam Crow, so when Chips takes notice of the bruises on Juice's neck from the chain, he tries to write it off with his previous comedic charm, but Chips really isn't buying it. So when Juice inevitably tries to go for another swing from the tree, Chips follows him and catches him in the act. Jesus! What the hell are you doing? You coward! Chips tells Jax about what happened and being able to relate to the grief that Juice is dealing with, they elect to keep an eye on him and see if he can work through it as opposed to telling the club and having his patch stripped. 
Roosevelt sees the bruises on Juice's neck and informs Potter that they may be losing their leverage due to Juice's mental instability. So Potter has Juice brought in to give him the download on the Rico case against the club and Juice rightfully freaks out because there was never supposed to be a case against the club in the first place, meaning that his betrayal was ostensibly for nothing. However, Potter's true targets are the IRA that supplies the weapons and the Galindo cartel that supplies the coke, so he makes Juice a deal. If you give me the information on the cartel Irish sit-down, I will extract the sons from the Rico equation. Some members of Sam Crow will have to pay for their involvement, but the Sons of Anarchy Motorcycle Club will survive. Roosevelt tries to apologize for his behavior as he reveals that he's getting screwed over by Potter too, but it's too late because after the damage he's done and not wanting every Sons of Anarchy charter to crash under the weight of Rico, Juice agrees to spy for Potter, thinking he's doing the right thing by saving the club. His current mindset is further indicated by the way he recklessly walks through an active minefield after having people set them off in front of him. This doesn't go unnoticed by Chips and Jax. You gotta talk to Juice, would you? The shit today was crazy. He is making me very nervous. Worried that he still has a death wish, Chibs eventually gets a confession out of Juice about the leverage Potter and Roosevelt have over him, and he finally confesses his black heritage, which Chibs scoffs at, with it being such a nothing burger of an issue. And credit to Kurt Sutter in the writer's room because there's a lot of anti-black sentiment, especially in a lot of predominantly white old school MCs, a lot of which have turned around on that, but in all fairness to Juice, and I'm not excusing the spying, but it makes real world sense that he'd think that he'd be ousted over such a seemingly inconsequential thing. The reason for this is because a lot of these MCs were founded during times of segregation or like right after desegregation, and they wouldn't allow people of color to patch in, but there was a particular disdain for black people specifically. MC ain't gonna give a shit about you being loyal or hard. It's all they gonna see is black. You can see the results of this division when observing the all black MC, the Grim Bastards, who more than likely established their club together because they wouldn't be welcomed anywhere else. Not yet, anyway. And even though they are allies with the Sons, there's still a pervasive amount of racism that persists and factors into how they operate, especially amongst some of its older members, and I'm sure Juice has picked up on that. Someone last night in a gangster SUV gunned down my daughter. That smelled just like revenge to me. Old fat bastard here says nigga one more time and that walking out alive deal we talked about. Off the goddamn table. Even with this newfound exoneration from Chibs, Juice still lets Potter and the ATF know when the IRA cartel meeting is going down, again thinking that he's doing what's best for the club. He gets picked up and detained by the feds, but when the shit is supposed to go down, it doesn't because it turns out that the cartel is working with the CIA to keep the coke and guns flowing because, well, this is the American government we're talking about, and the RICO case is put on ice for the time being. Because of the fallout, Juice is released from his service and Roosevelt hands over the records of Juice's black lineage, surrendering his leverage and promising not to rat him out to the club. You're a criminal. I'm a cop. I'll stop you. I just want to get back to that. Yeah, okay. It was a phenomenal season. I'm I'm super, you know, blessed as a as a person and as a as an actor on the show and as a character. I thought that I had so much fun last year. I mean he really put me through the ringer, Kurt, that's who's right next to me. And uh he masterfully just created this really took this character who was kind of this, you know, the the comedy thing and you know kind of this innocent lap dog running around following everybody and really put him in this really precarious situations that a lot of drama ensued from I felt like I was crying all the time and it really a lot of the secrets now and the repercussions that are going to come from that it's really interesting to watch it play out. For the most part of season 5, Juice is put on babysitting duty for Clay, who was shot by Opie at the end of last season, leaving him weak and hobbled. 
an assignment that Juice doesn't particularly mind due to the newfound respect Clay has for him and the bond they formed after receiving the Men of Mayhem patch. When Clay confesses to killing Piney, citing that he had no choice, Juice is visibly shaken by knowing that he isn't the only one to have killed another member, tightening their bond even more, almost becoming Clay's right hand man, just like Tig was in the first few seasons. And those first few seasons resonate because things seem to be getting back to normal for Juice, with him being a lot less dramatic and a lot more comedic. And we should go. I'm just getting comfortable. Do you think you're the only one who gets to play with white trash? Actually, I'm Puerto Rican. Stop talking, honey. Okay. But this levity was never meant to last, as Juice can see how shady and shifty Clay has been following a string of home invasions within Charming. Right after he drops off Clay and Unser's, two of the three newly patched in nomads wind up getting shot and killed, but not before Juice gives Clay the heads up that a car had pulled into the parking lot. Clay not providing answers to Juice's inquiries makes him even more suspicious but out of a sense of loyalty, Juice doesn't say anything when the club starts digging into the nomads and who could be the top man of the home invasions. Before they died, the nomads accidentally get Roosevelt's wife killed and he knows that the MC was somehow involved. With no leads and no cards left to play, Roosevelt reneges on his promise to Juice and threatens him with his father's heritage in order to get intel on the location of the third nomad. Frankie. You're gonna get me killed. That concern left me when I watched my wife die. He even goes as far as to tell Jax that another member of the club has been working with the feds on the Rico case and promises to tell Jax who the rat is if he delivers Frankie alive. Clay gets suspicious about how hard Roosevelt has been riding Juice and starts to interrogate him. Under the weight of all the secrecy and guilt, Juice finally cracks and explains the whole blackmail situation and how things played out with the Brick of Coke, Miles, and the Rico case. In order to establish further trust, Clay confesses to setting the home invasions with the nomads in motion, alleviating some of the pressure of the lies off Juice, relieved that he could finally tell someone and they actually understood without any judgment or scrutiny. While on the hunt for Frankie, Clay gets a tip on his location and he and Juice head up to take him out despite Juice knowing that Jax wanted him alive. But before Clay can kill him to save his own skin, Jax and the club show up in the nick of time. Frankie ends up getting domed anyway with zero issue to Clay, and when asked why he didn't say anything after he found him, Juice covers for Clay stating that they wanted to make sure it was legit first. A dead Frankie irritates Roosevelt, and when he brings up the rat inside Sam Crow, Jax tells him that he already deduced who it is, but his suspicions only crystallize after he follows Juice home just in time to see him getting picked up without being handcuffed. Feeling guilty about putting Juice in the line of fire, Roosevelt tells him that Jax knows everything and to split town before the MC finds out, but rather than doing that, Juice goes to see Jax first thing in the morning to confront him. He tries to explain everything, but Jax ain't trying to hear that. Miles didn't steal a coke, did he? He caught you stealing it. That was an accident. Shut up! Jax gives Juice an ultimatum to earn his way back into the good graces of the club by telling him to help expose Clay by finding some legal documents taken by the nomads or die for being a traitor, not really giving him much of a choice. While searching for the documents in Clay's house, Clay walks in and lets Juice know how much he appreciates him, which almost causes Juice to break. Later on, he eventually does find them in the air vents and gets instructed by Jax to leave them there so he can show the other members. However, when they go to get them, Clay's already moved them because he was suspicious of Juice's earlier behavior. Fearing for his own life and wanting to prove his loyalty, Juice gives Jax one of Clay's guns, and Jax uses it to assassinate a big time gangster named Damon Pope, leaving it at the crime scene for Roosevelt to find. Clay confesses that he knows Juice tried to give Jax the documents, but still loves him anyway, and despite Juice suddenly having a change of heart about Jax's entire scheme, it's too late, and Roosevelt arrests Clay for the murder of Damon Pope. How's he feeling? Such a loaded question. Um... He's feeling awful about it because he tried to get him, you know, kind of to give him a warning when he realized it was too late. And I think now what we'll see is uh, this season kind of how that all affects him and what it does to him. And I'm lucky enough to, you know, 
we're going to see a whole other side of this character that we haven't seen in five seasons. The betrayal of the one person who trusted him in conjunction with his initial betrayal of the club causes a change in Juice more intense than the last going forward in the show. We never really see Juice laughing and smiling and joking with the guys anymore because the trauma that he's been through for the past two seasons has had an adverse effect on him detrimental to a positive character arc. And that's sort of the thing with Juice. He's the antithesis to Jax. Through a bevy of schemes and half-truths, which we will get into eventually, just like Juice, Jax lies to and betrays the trust of the club on multiple occasions thinking that it was for the greater good but the difference between the two is that Jax actually learns from his mistakes in order to become a better leader as where Juice allows those mistakes to consume him and he begins to spiral on a downward trajectory. I'm just a guy who knows a coward when I see one. Okay. Because of his part in Jax's plot against Clay, Jax gives Juice a pass for all his misdeeds, but all Chibs wants to do is give him a beatdown for being a rat, which Juice readily accepts. His downward trend is emblematic of the chip he now carries on his shoulder, feeling like he's got something to prove even though Jax lets him know that they're good, but Juice still feels like he hasn't been fully redeemed yet. He feels he actually has to live up to the badass biker that he's always portrayed himself as, something that even the other members pick up on. Come on! Hey, 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 hey! Ah. He ain't right! That's new. At the behest of Jax, Juice suffocates a grief-stricken woman named Darvini, who Jax couldn't risk talking to the police about their gun business. No doubt, thinking of himself and his own experience with ratting to the cops and what might have happened to him had he not been shown mercy, all the while making it look like a drug OD. Not only is he apathetic toward the physical well-being of others, but that extends to their emotional state as well. While tailing Jax's wife Tara to keep an eye on her, she runs over his bike in frustration and later on, he goes to her job and tells her that Jax is at the club's brothel, Diosa, knowing that he'd be there sleeping with the madam and knowing that this would hurt Tara, exactly the kind of information we've seen him withhold before. Where is he? Who? Really? None of this weirdness goes unnoticed by Jax, so during a mission to jailbreak Clay, Jax finally caves and asks Juice what's going on with him, but Juice assures Jax that he's fine. I'm not having a breakdown, man. I didn't think you were. I gotta feel like I'm doing something right, Jax. Not like right or wrong, kind of right, but I gotta feel like I'm, I'm like you're one of the good guys. Yeah. I used to not find some of that. Despite his insistence on being okay, his mental state is definitely up for debate as he runs over one of the sheriffs shooting at them during the jailbreak where they explicitly weren't supposed to kill anyone when he probably could have just driven away instead. Juice is the first person that Clay thanks for springing him free, simultaneously reassuring him that he did what he had to do with that sheriff and letting him know that there were no hard feelings for what went down with Pope and the gun planted at the crime scene. Unbeknownst to Clay, the club took a mayhem vote on him that passed, which has to be unanimous to do so, meaning that Juice voted yes on executing Clay for all his past transgressions, making him once again think about how close he was to meeting the same end. This action winds up Juice so much that he steals some of Bobby's oxy and ODs on it, causing him to pass out. He gets saved by Jax's mother Gemma and her boyfriend Nero, but in his warped state of mind, he confesses to Nero that Jax is the one that ordered him to kill Darvini, someone Nero was very close to. The next day, he's confronted by Gemma about what happened and if he's okay, and he gives her the same answer he gave Jax. I don't want to die, Jim. I'm just a little unsure about how to live in all this right now. She gives him some words of encouragement and for a second, he feels things might actually start to be turning around for the better, but that brief ray of sunshine suddenly gets clouded when it's revealed that Nero told Jax what Juice told him, putting their entire business relationship in flux, leading Jax to completely disown and abandon Juice for talking. You betrayed me. Later on, while looking for Gemma, 
Juice pulls up to a scene of Tara's murder committed by Gemma and shoots Roosevelt before he can call it in. Seeing himself in Gemma, Juice doesn't want her to suffer the same fate as Darvini or Clay, so he helps her out by hiding the evidence and getting her clear before Jax comes home to find his slain wife, setting the stage for the upcoming final season and Jax's inevitable confrontation with Juice. Will the diehard fans like the ending? Oh. I, I think that... How do you I, answer that? I, I think they're... What do you think? Extremely satisfied. No, you know, I think, uh, I think it'll be, um, without spoiling, I think it'll be a satisfying ending, you know? Um, uh, I wouldn't say that it's going to be a happy ending. <laughs> it'll be a satisfying ending. With the blame of Tara's death being chalked up to gangland violence, the trail is thrown off Gemma and she hides Juice and Charming as a thank you. However, Unser finds him and gets held captive and Juice refuses to kill him. Unser figures out that it was Gemma that hid Juice and agrees to help him out in exchange for intel on Tara's murder, but with Jax fresh out of jail, Juice has no choice but to split town. But when he tries, his sentimentality gets the better of him and he can't do it just like before, realizing that the club is all he's got. Holding out hope that there's some way, any way, he can earn his way back in, he has Unser reach out to Chibs, the person that he has the closest connection to in the club, to see if there's anything he can do, and with zero sympathy, Chibs tells Juice the one thing he didn't want to hear. If I were you, I'd get that gun, put it in my mouth, and pull the trigger. I'm sorry, brother. I never meant to hurt the club. It's the only family I have. I love you. At this point, Juice is too erratic to be left in Charming, making him a liability to everyone helping him, so Gemma forces Unser and Wendy to take him out of town in just in time because the DA's office has put out an APB on him. With both the MC and the cops looking for Juice, the plan is to get Juice completely out of the county, but after a massacre takes place at Diosa, perpetuated by Henry Lin's crew in retaliation for the sun sabotaging the Chinese, Gemma is forced to step out leaving Juice alone at the hotel. When he mistakes an Asian man for one of Lin's crew, Juice shoots him when he enters the room, thinking that he was there to kill him, but it turns out that he was just a motel employee, thinking that the room was supposed to be vacant, further proof that Juice's instability is getting worse and worse. Gemma is forced to take action and pretends to drive Juice out of town, but is actually mulling over putting him out of his misery, as keeping him alive is too risky. When he asks what the plan is, she tells him that Nero was going to help them out. Nero knowing about Juice killing Darvini and then offering to help raises some crimson red flags and Juice knowing about the club's history of putting down rabid dogs leads him to deduce what's about to happen so he crashes the car and almost shoots her but only spares her after she begs for her life. He then goes to the Mayans and offers to trade any intel on Sam Crow in exchange for safe passage to Mexico, but underestimates their disdain for snitches as they trick him and turn him over to the Suns as a goodwill gesture for a truce between the clubs. Rather than giving him the mayhem he rightfully deserves, they force him to get himself locked up to get into prison so he can take out Henry Lin. While the cops have him in their sights, there's a split second where Juice thinks about letting the cops empty their mags into him and just ending it all, echoing when he was ready to swing from that tree a few seasons back, but he thinks better of it this time and allows himself to be arrested. While inside, he's given various items to piece together a ship from an Aryan shot caller named Tully, who also has a vested interest in Lin's demise. Speaking of Tully, he eventually meets Juice and, um, I can't describe or show the most intimate part of their relationship without risking the video getting suppressed or age restricted, but we're all adults here and this is prison, so use your imagination. He eventually gets to Lynn and does the deed, and when Jax reaches out to talk, Juice thinks it's about an update on Lynn, but what Jax actually wants is the truth about what happened to Tara that night she was murdered. He's been on the outside doing some investigating on his own and knows that Juice and Gemma are somehow involved and tearfully pleads for answers. 
Juice knows it's a long shot, but still hopes that taking care of Lin in conjunction with blunt honesty will be enough to earn his way back into Sam Crow. So while reciprocating Jax's tears in a scene that should have gotten Theo Rossi and Charlie Hunnam Emmy nominations, he tells Jax everything. Gemma killed Tara. He killed Roosevelt and covered the whole thing up by blaming Lin and the Chinese, setting up a domino effect of more death because Jax was on a warpath for vengeance. Juice offers his condolences, but Jax is fuming with an abundance of rage and sorrow that he throws forgiveness out the window. Jax thanks him for telling the truth, but the most he can do for Juice now is to make sure he has a quick death, leaving him to die. Juice pays the truth forward by calling Gemma and telling her that Jax knows, giving her a heads up for what's coming. His last few days now without misery, Tully finally gets the green light to bring mayhem to Juice. Rather than resisting fate, Juice accepts the futility of his situation, handing a scalpel over to Tully. His final request and final words, now infamous throughout the Sons of Anarchy fandom. Just let me finish my pie. And with that, Tully stabs Juice in the neck, resulting in him bleeding out and dying on the floor, bringing an end to the once proud member of the Sons of Anarchy Motorcycle Club. It was all the lies that caused Juice to put that chain around his neck just a few seasons prior, but ironically, it's the truth that ultimately leads to his downfall while confined behind bars. The truth is what gives Juice his freedom, not just from the actual prison, but the prison in his own mind, built on a foundation of fabrications and betrayal and fear of discrimination and rejection. And I think that's pretty sad because to put it in his own words, I'm a coward. The most common criticism I see of Juice is his supposed sudden personality change coming out of nowhere, but I gotta disagree. Going from being comedic relief to anxious and angry to ultra-violent is a natural evolution of his character given the circumstances. This progression is believable not only due to the way Kurt Sutter brilliantly wrote Juice to transform without invalidating or contradicting his old character, but also in the way Theo Rossi's shining performance as this tortured soul elevates everything to a whole new level. How this man never got an Emmy nom, I will never know. Despite the snub, Rossi had firmly established himself as an amazing actor and would go on to star in other projects including Emily the Criminal, which is coming out probably the day I upload this video. And he also started the Reaper Reviews podcast with Tig's actor Kim Coates, where they very recently had on Charlie Hunnam. Kurt Sutter, of course, with the success of the show, would go on to create the Sons of Anarchy spinoff series, Mayans MC. And we'll talk about Mayans eventually, so be sure to like and subscribe if you want to see that one day. It's no secret that Kurt Sutter used Hamlet as the foundation for the plot of Sons of Anarchy, and more often than not, I see fans online view Juice as a parallel for Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, the close friends turned traitors of Jax's Hamlet. However, as opposed to a Shakespearean character, I see Juice being closer to the tragic figure of Greek myth, Sisyphus. Sisyphus was a king who, after cheating death twice, was punished by the god Zeus in the underworld. His task was to roll this giant boulder up a hill, but every time he would do it and get to the top, the boulder would roll all the way back down and he'd be forced to start over again, and this went on and on forever. Juice is someone who cheated the club multiple times and every time it seems like he had an opportunity for redemption, every time it seemed like he could work his way back into the club's good graces, he'd screw it up and repeat the same type of behavior that got him outcast in the first place, just doomed to fail repeatedly over and over again. And just like Sisyphus, he recognizes the futility of shoving that rock up that hill and gives in to the absurdity of it all. But rather than allowing him to suffer and rot in the underworld or prison, a merciful god in the form of Jax gives Juice an out, allowing Tully to do the one thing that Juice either couldn't or wouldn't do on his own. Albeit for completely different reasons, I can relate to Juice because I've been through the same depression and anxiety that he's been through, however, 
he allowed his self-destructive nature to not only endanger himself, but the people he called his brothers. He was a guy who made the decisions he did based on fear of what Sam Crow might do to him, but had he been courageous and told the inconvenient, crushing truth, none of that would have happened. In the end, he became a slave to his own fear, and as the old saying goes, don't fear the reaper. I just, I don't like being alone. I'm not good on my own. My head gets so loud. And shit doesn't make, nothing sinks up. I start thinking about my thinking. And getting lost in the details of nothing. Nothing for me out Thank you guys so much for watching. Um, this took a little longer than I would have liked because my mental health this past month has absolutely tanked and it didn't help that I was having to talk and think about a character who also had a lot of mental health issues, but ultimately that's what made me relate to him on a level beyond motorcycles so i really hope you guys enjoyed and if you guys are having any mental health struggles on your own you can always message me or comment or whatever because life sucks right now but at the end of the day we all we got so again thank y'all thank y'all so much um yeah <laughs> i'm josh fleeks till next time y'all be easy